The second lecture in this series has to do with national parks in the United States. Why were they founded? How this finding, founding of national parks might reflect on different ideas of what is nature and why nature needs to be protected. The reason that I chose the United States for the bulk of the second lecture is that many historians believe that the first national park was established in the United States. It depends a little bit upon how you count that, but anyway. The main idea for a national park of some sort seems to have come from the United States. Our present day ideas about conservation and preservation originated in the United States during the latter years of the 1800s and the beginning of the 1900s. There was a split in the movement to protect nature into conservationists and into preservationists and this split to some extent still exists around the world today. These ideas about preservation and conservation are also related to and form one of the roots to sustainability. And for us to understand what sustainability means today, we have to understand some of its past. Otherwise, we don't quite understand what exactly was originally meant by sustainability and where the concept is coming from. Much of this second lecture will be based on narrated PowerPoints, although you'll see me from time to time. And one of the reasons for that is that I don't want to add to my ecological footprint by jetting off to the United States and getting a few minutes, min and getting a few minutes of video footage from each national park that I want to include. I've been to one of the ones that I'm talking about for other reasons, not for this uh, filming, and that's why it's included. While in 2022, 2023, or 2024, it might seem like the United States is not exactly a leading and progressive country in the area of environmental protection and nature protection. And in fact, we might even see the United States as being sort of a villain in climate change negotiations, although the country is not, low, is not the only one uh, that has that sort of uh, reputation. But if we go back far enough into the past, say before the 1980s, the United States was largely considered to be one of the more progressive countries when it came to nature protection and environmental concern, even if it was a car-dependent country already at that time. And then the United States increasingly fell behind compared to a number of other countries. Uh, and uh, by this century, the, the 2000s, it was rather clear that the United States was quite behind in a number of different areas perhaps in part because of political lack of interest in the environment and lack of interest in engaging with the rest of the world in a constructive way when it comes to the environment. So even the EU as a whole, uh, a few decades ago, caught up to and surpassed the United States, even if there are some member states in the EU which very begrudgingly do perhaps live up to the minimum standards for the environment that the EU has established. Here we can see a map of the United States and we can see that all of the national parks in the United States are marked in blue. We see that there's a majority of these national parks in the western half of the United States and in Alaska and particularly in Alaska that the national parks are quite large in size. This map is a bit dated. Uh, right now when I'm recording this it's the year 2020 um, we can say that during the time that President Trump has occupied the White House, he's not exactly been all that environmentally friendly. Um, so I suspect that no um, new national parks have been created during this period of time. First off, we'll start in the eastern part of the United States, in the state of Maine, uh, with Acadia National Park. I should also say, before I go any further here, that all of the pictures that don't have a specific credit um, in, in this uh, lecture um, 
They either come from the National Park Service, sometimes abbreviated NPS, or they are in the public domain. That is to say that the rights and copyright and so forth have been taken over uh, in general by everyone because the photograph is so old that we no longer necessarily have to credit uh, the photographer. Or in some cases, the photographer is unknown and the picture may exist on the website of a government agency in the United States. Continuing onward. Acadia National Park. <clears throat> um, we're beginning here. One of the reasons we're, we're doing that uh, is that there is some sort of an assumption uh, in many cases in the United States that the majority of people will be entering a national park by car. Uh, perhaps a tourist bus is arriving, but otherwise it's a motor vehicle. That's how you go into the park. Um, and then you are at a gate and you pay to enter the park. As we can see here, um, it's also possible to buy an annual pass. Um, maybe you can stick it on your car uh, and then you don't have to pay any more times. You've gone into the park as many times as you want because you've paid once. This is quite different than in a place like Sweden, where the upkeep and maintenance of the park and the wages of the employees in the park come in part from entrance fees and in part from taxation, or however the, the in this case, the federal government spends money, has money from someplace to, to uh, cover the costs. Quite different than the Swedish perspective. So here we are. Um, we are on uh, Cadillac Mountain, is the name of it. Uh, has nothing to do with General Motors Cadillac cars, as far as I know. Um, and when we look at this picture, we think to ourselves, those of us who are familiar with landscapes and, and geography in Sweden, we think, well, this could be perhaps um, someplace in Bohuslän, looking out in, in, at, at the sea. And here, here we are, not on the exact top of Cadillac Mountain, but almost at the top. Uh, and we're looking out into the Atlantic. And it just happens to be Midsummer's Day, 2011. But if we were to turn 180 degrees around and then walk 10 or 20 meters, what would we see? So yes, almost at the very top of one of the highest mountains in the National Park, we have a parking lot. And everyone has driven up there. Of course, there are some people that maybe have hiked up there, but uh, even in a national park, or at least some national parks in the United States, the American love of the automobile is even present there. But. Of course, the entire park is not overrun by cars and has roads. Here is another picture taken uh, the National Park. And again, we have a sense that, well, there might be some places in Sweden that might look like this. Um, large parts of the Swedish countryside and nature could look something like this, although there will be places like Gotland and, and uh, Östergötland and Skåne, where there'll be mostly agricultural land, but you could sort of be suddenly placed there and think that you could be in Sweden or Norway or Finland. Now, as you walk around in the National Park, in some places you walk on or you come across these very wide, very wide paths. Um, and you start to wonder, what are these paths? There are no cars on them. And there are signs saying that cars are prohibited to drive there. And after a while, you start to think, if you were me, well, maybe there were areas that were prone to fire and parts of the park burned. And of course, if, if it's a national park and we're thinking about preserving nature, fire is a number of, uh, one of a number of different natural processes. So we could expect perhaps that there would be the occasional forest fire caused by a lightning strike. And if it went out after a few hectares burned, then okay, so what? 
but maybe um, in the past some of the paths were widened I was thinking as I was walking around so that um, fire vehicles motorized fire trucks could drive into the part of the park and be used to help put out uh, the fire or or contain its spread <clears throat> very nice um, I mean they're not exactly level but uh, very well maintained wide paths um, and the inclination in other words how steep they are they tend to be not so steep in most places and then as you're moving further and further into the park on a walk like this um, you come across a stone bridge and you look at it and you think to yourself like I did this looks really old and look how what how nice decorations there were uh, either this was here before the park was founded and it was just left there or who knows um, it doesn't look like in this case that the bridge was built with the idea of of fire trucks driving over it hmm very curious what can this be One feature that is, of course, very nice about this is that with a very wide kind of path or trail, we can see, like in these pictures, that there's plenty of room for people who are walking for a day's walk, and there's plenty of room, uh, of course, for those that are on, on mountain bikes or gravel bikes, that it's, there's lots of room to share the path, as opposed to a much narrower path where that might be much more difficult. But then we have to sort of think about not only where do these paths that are very wide come from, but how was Acadia National Park founded? What was the process that led to that? Let's, let's look a little closer at this. Well, the, one of the people that is originally credited with the idea of trying to set aside what becomes Acadia National Park as something that could be called a national park, although the word didn't exist in American English at the time. We have a landscape architect named Charles Eliot, um, and he has a growing idea of, of thinking about setting aside certain places um, for, as what we would think of as a nature preserve um, or with much greater protection, what we would think of as perhaps as a national park. Um, he has visited what becomes uh, Acadia National Park. He's gone to other places. He's trying to get people organized to do this. Um, but then during uh, uh, the latter half of the 1800s, he gets, uh, he gets sick and he dies. Um, he has, of course, written things and he's trying to encourage people. He was thinking that we can't just have <clears throat> um, certain people that can use the area. It was important that areas of natural beauty would be possible and open for recreation for everyone. Future generations needed to be able to use this land. He realized that on these coastal locations where Acadia National Park would come to be built that um, he and, and others thinking like him didn't want rich people to just buy up all the nice uh, places and then build so-called cottages. And what the rich meant by a cottage wasn't a, um, a small building that we would think of today as a Sommerstuga with what, um, two or three rooms <coughs> and perhaps cold water or cold and hot water in it. Now, uh, an, a cottage that rich people in Boston and New York were building uh, in this part of Maine and they would spend the summers there. A cottage might have 12 or 20 rooms and then there would be a cottage beside it where the gardener, um, where a maid uh, and so forth, perhaps a cook would be living during those summer months. And Elliot and others, were, they were very struck by the natural beauty in this place as opposed to other places along the coast of the United States um, there's a great difference in elevation right by the water. It's not nearly that much of a difference in elevation if you're near Boston or New York City, uh, Washington DC and so forth. The land is relatively flat uh, 
uh, in many places near the coast. So at some point in time we have the fellow on the right, George Dorr, um, and he together with other people, I'm simplifying this story significantly to save time, uh, Dorr and others establish a foundation. In Swedish a foundation is a stiftelse, with the idea that a foundation isn't trying to make a profit, it is something that the members of the foundation uh, will find beneficial or it is something for the public good. So in 1901 he manages to establish a foundation to begin to purchase land and to be able to protect this land um, either for preservation or conservation. Um, right now I'm using the word preservation and we'll see how those words are used in English in a bit later in this lecture. Um, things gonna start out slow not many people are willing to um, put money into the foundation. Uh, some of the rich people that, that might own uh, land there, they might decide that they might give half of their land to the foundation um, or whatever that, what they would do. And Dur, uh, he really is, uh, I don't want to say that he's desperate, but he, he really is interested in in getting money that he can use to then, on behalf of the foundation, buy this land and set it aside. Um, and he, he and others are aware that um, we have Yellowstone National Park and Yosemite National Park and a few other parks in the western part of the United States that exist at this time. Um, and he feels, he and others feels that they can't wait for the federal government to do anything, so they need to buy land now. Um, and so at some point he turns to um, a number of wealthy individuals to see if they might be sympathetic. Among others he turns to a Rockefeller. Uh, and we know that the Rockefellers made a lot of money when it came to oil and petroleum refining and that the oil and petroleum products were used in industry but they were also used for motorized transport like for cars. So here we have Dorr saying, coming with his hat in his hand, please, Mr. Rockefeller, could you give me $10,000? Or something which sounds like a ridiculously small amount of money now. And for Rockefeller, I'm sure it was ridiculously small, but at the time it was probably a sizable amount of money. You could live probably a few years on $10,000 without any problem uh, at that time. <clears throat> and Yes, Rockefeller at first, he begins giving some money. He himself has some property um, in Maine, and so he can see the point that he wouldn't want all his other rich friends to have everything along there, and it would, might make, make sense that some of the land is owned by the public. Uh, and this is great, and money is rolling into the foundation, and Dorr can buy land. Um, and he can convince people that it will be going to a good purpose and he can convince them that here we have Rockefeller, this great philanthropist who's putting all this money in here for the public good. But after a while, Rockefeller starts to say, here's some more money, but by the way, I have some ideas. Maybe you should buy more here because the land is very beautiful here, the view is beautiful, uh, and so forth. Uh, and Dorr, of course, he can't bite the hand that's feeding him, so he sometimes has to go along with what Rockefeller is saying to him, and sometimes maybe he just sort of forgets to do some of the things that Rockefeller is suggesting <clears throat> that uh, Dorr should be doing with the foundation. Now, John Rockefeller, John Rockefeller Jr., considering the fact that he is very wealthy and the demand for the Rockefeller products in some cases come from motorized transport uh, from, from the use of cars. Um, Rockefeller is a bit old fashioned. He doesn't like cars. Okay, I have to ride a car sometimes, but he doesn't like it. He prefers when the weather is nice to be driven around in a carriage pulled by horses. And particularly when he is in Maine in the summer months and the weather is nice, uh, or if the weather is nice and it's not windy and the air is still maybe in the winter, 
covered up in blankets and being driven around in a, in a, in a carriage by horses. And, and this is what he really uh, likes and appreciates. So now we know why there are a number of so-called carriage roads in various places in Acadia National Park. Rockefeller said to Dora, okay, <clears throat> here's X amount more money, but I would like to have a, a three mile, five kilometer long carriage road along here. Make sure that some of that money goes to making that, that uh, carriage road. And we can see in this picture that was uh, taken much more recently, we can see that this is one of a number of bridges that exist built of stone at some point in time to look more rustic. Um, it might have been easier to do that and to build them out of concrete in the middle of nowhere uh, because Acadia National Park is a bit difficult to get to and it is in a way the middle of nowhere. Um, and so it seems like it's still possible to pay some money and take a ride on a horse-drawn carriage just like Rockefeller did. And now we understand. And so what we have here is we have in this area, which is a national park where nature is being protected, uh, but also since it is a so-called park that people are invited to participate, uh, not part they're to invited to, to come to the park, walk around, climb rock faces, um, in certain locations camp, uh, and so forth. Uh, but otherwise everything is strictly maintained. But we have uh, these cultural artifacts, thanks to um, Rockefeller and his interest that are still there in the middle of the National Park. And they become a sort of a feature that exists in this National Park and don't exist in other ones. And it's in a sense nice to keep that and there will be an environmental d damage if you had to have use heavy equipment to remove everything. Uh, so it probably makes more sense when it comes to the environment that uh, we keep them. It would also mean that people on their mountain bikes um, or regular bikes uh, who aren't too adventuresome and most people who are out just for a day hike and are going to go back to their hotel outside the park, that means they'll probably stay along these paths and not use the other paths. So it sort of channels the human impact in the park to a few locations and in some ways that makes a lot of sense. Here I will try to summarize what you have learned so far during this lecture about Acadia National Park. I will also add on a few points. When you're listening to this summary, try to think about how this summary might be useful when you listen to other stories about other national parks and how they were founded, that there might be similarities and there might be differences. First, we come to the driving reasons that led to the foundation of Acadia National Park. There, were, there was going to be land that was going to be set aside to try to make sure that the rich elites in Boston and New York didn't buy up all the land. For lack of a better word, but that word probably wasn't being used at that time, there was a natural resource in the form of scenic beauty uh, that was limited and that needed to be made sure that it wasn't just being used by small groups of people. This leads on to the second point, some sort of an egalitarian idea, that it was important for anyone who was able to get there to be able to enjoy nature and see the scenic beauty. Uh, another point, which I didn't mention before, that since so much of the eastern coast of the United States from Florida north all the way along the Atlantic uh, to Maine is very flat and there isn't all that much change in elevation for this first 10 or 20 or 30 kilometers inland. These places in Maine near what becomes Acadia National Park there was a great difference in elevation. There are small mountains and hills on the coast or close to the coast and so this was a compared to much of the rest of the part of the eastern United States, a unique kind of landscape, and therefore it needed some kind of protection. The next group of points, since the federal government, and where I'm talking about here, Acadia National Park, the state government of Maine, 
didn't seem to be all that interested in nature protection at the time, or attention was being diverted elsewhere uh, to the western part of the United States, um, it became necessary for an NGO, a non-governmental organization in today's terminology, at the time it was referred to as a foundation, uh, to be formed, to raise money, to raise awareness um, and interest, and to become what could be called today, to become activists. Although I'm sure that Eliot and Dorr in the late 1800s and into the 1900s probably wouldn't have liked a modern-day label of activist associated with them. <clears throat> to be able to gain enough money, Dorr, he needed to uh, uh, approach sympathetic, rich people who would donate some of their money in, in, in th uh, philanthropy. And some of these people could be those who already own some land nearby what would become Acadia National Park. So we could see in some ways there was a conflict of interest and so there was a lot of effort that was needed here. We can also see that the whole process leading to Acadia National Park was a mixture of what we could call idealistic uh, utopian practice or whatever, a vision, plus hard practical philanthropy. And as we heard, sometimes there were strings attached to the philanthropic donations. And we can still see some of this in parts of the park today. The last group of points. It doesn't seem like there was all that much natural science that was the basis for the establishment of uh, what becomes Acadia National Park on the part of the foundation. And at least initially, the park was not managed uh, based on ecological principles, or at least in our understanding of ecology as it is today. I had to skip over this part because this lecture is already long enough. Instead, interest for recreation, protection of landscapes, and what was considered attractive and beautiful, those were the driving principles, not nature protection in our sense of the word with ecology ecological principles behind it. At some point, after the foundation had purchased enough land and they felt like they couldn't go much further than that, at some point all this was donated to the United States government. And eventually, after some time, it became a national park. It had another name and at some point, much later, it became known as the Acadia National Park when it was expanded later on. So if all of this history shows that the background to the park played out in a way which perhaps would be less likely to occur today in a country like the United States, or Sweden, or Germany, or France, etc. Um, because most likely some sort of ecological thinking would be involved in the creation of a national park. And also the, uh, the activities of the NGO to buy land might not be as important. It might be that the government in a particular country would become much more active as needed to do that. And so we can see that some of the interests and the driving factors behind this park are not exactly what we would see today, but at the same time we can see a sort of a shadow of um, the interests and the drive, driving forces and so forth at the time. We can still see that in the park today. So when you listen to the other stories, so to speak, about national parks in the United States, I hope you think about this summary uh, and see whether there are similarities or differences between this national park and its story and the other three national parks. Let's move on now to Yosemite National Park. We have moved from the eastern part of the United States to almost as far west you can get in the continental United States, ignoring Alaska and, and, uh, and Hawaii. We are in California. Now, until about the 1850s, this area um, in what is now the United States was um, a part of Mexico. And before that, before the Mexican War of Independence, uh, which had occurred 30, 40, 50 years before that, um, 
Uh, it was a, it was a Spanish territory as part of the Spanish Empire, um, and the United States uh, took over uh, California and Texas and so forth and other places from Mexico as part of some sort of uh, imperial ambitions as well. But uh, up until this time, very few Americans of Northern European descent or Europeans had seen Yosemite National Park, what becomes Yosemite National Park, because it was very difficult to reach. Um, the, the, some place that would be like San Francisco, there were buildings there, you could, you could arrive by boat, um, but then it, you would have to travel a long distance with very few roads in poor condition, uh, and then you have to get up into the mountains and so forth. Uh, in the 1850s, there is some sort of awareness that that a uh, number of people are built, that, that there is some sort of fantastic beauty there. Uh, this goes into the 1860s, and that there's a risk that as uh, California now part of the United States, that there's uh, uh, gold mining, other kinds of mining, uh, uh, trees are being cut down for lumber and timber. The redwoods look like they're fine, huge trees that would make a, a, a lot of nice wood or paper or whatever. And people were starting to build um, small huts and so forth in the area. So um, the federal government, right in the middle of the war between the North and the South, uh, what is sometimes referred to as the Civil War, uh, despite the war, Lincoln and the Northern Congress decide that they will buy this land or they will decide, whoever, regardless of whoever is there, that this is going to be land that cannot be used for anything else than for protection, but the federal government really shouldn't be involved in, well, the word didn't exist at the time, nature protection. Uh, so the land is given to the state of California for protection. and. Increasingly, there becomes an awareness because the landscapes were quite unique. Um, we have species which were only growing in the Sierra Nevada mountains where Yosemite National Park is. The combinations of what we would refer to of a combination of various species, what we would call ecosystems today, but the word didn't exist at the time. The word ecology hardly existed um, at this time either. So. We're moving on a few years after Lincoln gives this land to the state of California, uh, we have the arrival of John Muir. Muir was originally uh, from Scotland and his parents moved to the Midwest of the United States when he was uh, about 14, 15, 16 years old, uh, a teenager. Um, and he is known as being somebody who's rather restless. Um, and he's heard of the area and he decides that he's going to build himself a small hut there and live there. And he's going to learn firsthand things about geology and botany, which he had sporadically learned when he attended a university in Wisconsin for a year or two. Uh, after a few years, he becomes known as an expert um, because of him living there all the time and seeing all these things. Uh, one of the transcendentalists it wasn't Thoreau, but his older colleague, Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, visits in 1871 and essentially says, this is what I've envisioned, uh, a, a scholar who lives with nature. And Muir sees nature for him as a replacement for Christianity. It becomes his religion. He grew up in a, in a very strict religious family uh, and part of his restlessness when he would leave and tried to do other, other things. It was that nature he found, the, in nature he found the solution to philosophical problems. He is quoted as saying that nature is my cathedral. Um, he feels, he, Muir, begins to feel that um, the state of California is doing a bad job of this. Um, and he is in contact with people that are living in San Francisco, and he's not up in the mountains all the time, but um, uh, influential people who might be rich and who might have some interest in setting aside some nature from um, the advances of so-called civilization and industrialization. Uh, and he is seen as somebody who's a little exotic, uh, 
but also somebody who's very knowledgeable in the way that the people living in the city were not knowledgeable of, of Yosemite. They just thought it was something beautiful. And his interest is that we need to preserve many areas. Uh, and it isn't the case that we just have to preserve a particular place where we've seen a particular species. He understood that you needed to have a much larger area, uh, some sort of what we would refer to as a territory now, of course, uh, for individuals in that species to be able to survive. He understood that if there was going to be some sort of protection of land, the area would need to be rather large Otherwise, certain species would not be able to survive within the park area and they would be wandering to other places and they would get shot. Um, so he has a combination of something which seems like a scientific understanding, but also a very practical understanding from him spending a lot of time uh, in what becomes Yosemite National Park. Um, and he sees how uh, others who are not quite understanding the way that he is think that you could take sheep and have them graze in the meadows in various places and still be okay and he's furious because he realizes that there could be species that are native to the meadows that are needed for species that are in the woods and so forth back and forth. He, he had a much better understanding thanks to all of his observation. So what we can say is that this is, you know, this is um, more than 100 years ago, about 130, 150 years ago. There's no internet, there's no television, there's no radio, and if you wanted to know things, you had to read a newspaper. So Muir is inventing himself, not only as a person that is going to be trying to be on the site and protect nature, he's trying to become what we would call today an influencer but he doesn't know how. He wants to leverage other people who are more influential in society to do the things that he would like to have happen. And by leverage, in Swedish, we would think about an have stone. He starts to become known among some politicians and they could talk to other politicians and he starts to become known among others. He writes a number of books his uh, biographers later say that it was very difficult for him to write. He found it very difficult to do that. Uh, and these would appeal to more uh, members of the general public um, or, or people that were sort of interested in wildlife. And then after a while he began actively seeking out key supporters when he was in town, so to speak, in San Francisco or in other places in California businessmen who might be able to have some money in a way not so dissimilar from Door, politicians and the publishers. Um, the media at the time, like I was saying before, that was newspapers and there were some very wealthy in, uh, individuals who could be very influential about you know, what they wrote or had written in their newspaper and politicians and other businessmen would read it and so forth. And he would try to encourage people to come um, to what becomes in the future Yosemite National Park and that um, and they can see it firsthand and he can explain things and then they can become enthusiastic and then they can tell other people uh, and so forth. So we have this area that the state of California is taking care of. It's called at this point in time the Yosemite Grant. The land was sort of granted to California. Um, and Muir and others think that the state of California is doing a terrible job of this. And at some point there is an organization formed called the Sierra Club. And it's called that because the mountains on the border between California and Nevada are called the Sierra Nevada. Um, and they take the name from the first part of the, the mountains, a, a Spanish word meaning mountain range or something similar. Um, and the, the interest behind this is a combination of Muir and people like that, the, some of the wealthy individuals, and people are interested in mountain climbing. Um, and, and they might not be interested in protecting nature to begin with, but they could see that it was in connection with their recreational interests that something like a national park perhaps should be established. In the Sierra Club and in other circles, you have more and more people that are arriving. And at some point, um, <clears throat> Uh, a man named Gifford Pinchot um, arrives and is part of this and uh, Muir and Pinchot become friends. They see that they have a common interest in protecting nature. And they have not exactly the same idea about everything. 
Um, and then after a while, it becomes clear that uh, Muir and others and Pinchot and others really don't see eye to eye. They want to protect nature for different reasons. So a controversy breaks out. And in the 1890s, um, Muir and Pinchot have a falling out. They're upset at each other, or maybe Muir is particularly upset at Pinchot, and uh, maybe Pinchot is more disappointed with Muir. The controversy revolves around what in nature should be protected and for whom or for why. And this divides um, the, the uh, conservationists, at their, as they're called in a group together today, into two different groups. The conservationists um, have one particular perspective and the preservationists have another perspective. And we can use Muir and Pinchot to uh, be the people that will sort of be representative for these different kinds of interests. Since I've been talking a lot about John Muir, let's start with the conservationists and Gifford Pinchot. It, yes, it looks like Pinchot, but he said the name's pronounced Pinchot. The conservationists, they were interested in conserving nature, um, but they were interested in it from a more maybe anthropocentric perspective. The concern that the conservationists have was that they saw industrial firms, logging, timber, mining companies that were ruining nature. They were removing everything quickly and leaving a waste afterwards. So Pinchot and others thought that we need to exploit nature to some extent, but we need to do it more slowly. We need to have common resources that could be managed for the benefit of everyone and not just the benefit of the few in large companies. Also, we need to manage things carefully because we want to make sure that coming generations will one, still have these kinds of resources, two, nature can recover in the places where exploitation has been had and maybe 100, 200 years later we could then exploit that area again. Um, and, and the conservationists think that there's been all this reckless use of land. Um, but we still do need to use nature for our own purposes. It's just that we have to go much more slowly, much more purposefully. We have to say no sometimes. Um, and the, in the end, it is obviously for humans that nature exists. And Pinchot, is, it's claimed, was quoted as saying, or he's written in some place at one point, that forestry is nothing but tree farming. It's just it takes a lot longer time. And Pinchot is involved in establishing the United States Forest Service, which is part of the Department of Agriculture. And we see their symbol in the upper right hand corner. And he's in charge of the Forest Service for a while. And then at some point he's kicked out of the Forest Service. So the Forest Service would be managing forested lands with the idea for this conservation. So you might be able to walk around in a forested land uh, today and also in the past that's part of uh, the United States Forest Service and think that this seems like pristine nature or pretty good here, but you might walk an hour later and come to a place where everything has just been clear cut and it looks much more uh, industrial. So what about the preservationists? <clears throat> we need to protect nature, yes, for us, but primarily we need to protect nature for its own sake. Nature has value itself. There may be things that we don't understand yet. I mean, the science of ecology was barely starting at this period of time. Um, and uh, the preservationists, besides their need for just using nature in terms of some recreation, they would see spiritual qualities in nature and meditation. Even though life was maybe not as so stressful in, shall we say, 1890 or 1910 in San Francisco as it might be now, um, there would be people who would feel that they could spend, if they had the time and the money, a week someplace and recover from their stressful life. Yes, we need to use nature for modern human society. The preservationists did not say that, 
but we need to have more and more parts of nature, particularly unique nature, that has to be preserved, not conserved, but preserved forever, and preserved more on nature's own terms and less on uh, the human needs, as the conservationists will, would like it to be instead. So there's a controversy between these, these two gentlemen. So what was the end result? Here we see uh, again this iconic picture of, of Yosemite, a picture of Muir and um, some part of the park with visitors there. Well, we can say, of course, that in general, the idea behind the National Parks and the National Park Service um, is preservation, that we set aside nature for, for reasons of protecting nature for its own sake. But there is sort of a conservationist streak um, in that, in that recreation is required. I mean, they are called national parks, and national parks, the word park that it's used here is modeled on the idea of an urban park, or perhaps a half urban park, which was designed in such a way to in encourage recreation, walking, picnics, uh, and so forth. It would just be that a park would be in nature instead. Uh, and that's that's the more anthropocentric interpretation. Uh, there are, of course, places in national parks in various countries around the world where um, maybe there's no there's no encouragement that the general public visits there, and so that would mean that those parts of the park were, were are more um, developing along the lines that a preservationist would be thinking uh, of, and then some parts of the park, while well, there's no logging and mining and so forth taking place, it might feel a bit developed and a bit civilized and uh, more like uh, like a conservationist sort of viewing things. So what we can see is that in various places, we have the example in the United States, National Park Service, primarily the idea of preservation, United States Forest Service, primarily uh, conservationists, and we can see these uh, two, Muir and Pinchot, uh, some iconic pictures from around 1900-1910. On the left, Muir is standing in Yosemite National Park together with the president at the time, Theodore Roosevelt, and uh, Muir and others managed to convince Roosevelt around the year 1900 that the federal government needs to take over the park from the state of California that's doing such a bad job. Uh, and at the same time, we see Theodore Roosevelt in his top hat, um, socializing with Gifford Pinchot uh, on a yacht. And I suppose uh, it was important for Roosevelt to have a hat that made him about as tall as Pinchot instead. Uh, we could imagine that um, similar kinds of differences would exist in a country like Sweden, where certain government agencies and so forth would be more that, that we think of when it comes to nature. We would think of them as being more preservationist, and we would think of, of others as being more conservationist. And I'll let that up to you to sort of investigate that further, what kind of organizations this might be that would be more preservationist or more, more conservationist. So, I'd like you to, um, um, in a moment, take a pause uh, f and have a moment to reflect on this before continuing to look at the rest of the video or the lecture. What about your own views about nature protection? Are you mostly a preservationist, like Muir, or are you mostly a conservationist, like Pincho? Or are you maybe somewhere in between? And why do you have these views about nature protection? Why are you more or less a preservationist or conservationist or somewhere in between? Then the next question, which sort of follows, upon, follows from what I said in the previous slide, is Swedish nature protection more preservationist or more conservationist? Well, and why do you say so? How do you know the answer to that? You can't just guess and maybe you would like to try to figure it out. Let's move on to the next, next uh, national park, Yellowstone National Park. It is primarily located in 
the state of Wyoming, and it is um, uh, is part of the Rocky Mountains. In a way similar to Yosemite, Yellowstone was a place where very few uh, Americans of Northern European descent had seen or visited until the 1850s. There were um, American citizens that had visited the area and there was mention of geysers and so forth prior to the 1850s, but most people really didn't believe it. Uh, we see Ferdinand Hayden pictured here. He was a um, doctor during the Civil War, which was in the beginning of the 1860s, but before that um, he was a, a geologist, I believe. Um, so he was on an early um, uh, uh, expedition. I see that I wrote exhibition, not expedition there. Uh, and uh, uh, he and others, this group, saw and realized that this was a very special area. Uh, but because of the, the five-year war, uh, there wasn't all that much interest in uh, funding an additional visit to document this area, this special place. In 1871, uh, Ferdinand Hayden um, has received money and he has an, uh, a group of soldiers and a group of scientists, uh, an artist, a photographer uh, named William Henry Jackson uh, and so forth. And now he's decided he's going to do this really seriously. They're going to map and document and so forth. And we have to think about it in 1871 that a, a photographer usually took pictures in a very um, sort of calm setting. You had a studio, people stood there, they had to stand there for a while, uh, and then you stopped the exposure. Uh, or perhaps it, you, you took your pictures in a town and then you could take your camera and you could develop the film yourself with all the various chemicals. Here this fellow had to be out in the middle of nowhere, so to speak, and he had glass plates that were used for the images. Uh, and uh, as the story goes, um, they were hauled by horses and one time a horse slipped and um, <clears throat> uh, several days or several weeks of photog photography was ruined and he had to do it all over again. Hayden had the idea, together with other people, that Yellowstone needed to become the equivalent of the scenic resorts that he and others knew of that existed and the spas in the United Kingdom and Germany and Switzerland. Those scenic resorts and spas were much more cultural than natural. They were set in beautiful settings, but uh, most of the time you were in some sort of more like uh, um, civilized park, well manicured and taken care of. Here Haydn's idea was that he would sort of turn the tables and say this would be an American version of this, but it would be more natural than cultural. The human impact would be much smaller, was his idea. It would be grand as it was nature itself. And as he said, and or other people said, the idea was to establish a pleasure ground for the benefit and enjoyment of the people. So nature was being protected but for recreational purposes for humans. So uh, Haydn uh, managed to show a number of these pictures uh, and uh, the reports were read by assistants to congressmen and uh, the United States Congress rather quickly uh, decided that this area needed to be set aside um, in a way that uh, Yosemite had been set aside, but the land had been given to the state of California. So why didn't why didn't the the Congress decide to give the land in Yellowstone to some state? Well, that was because this area was not a state. The federal government owned and controlled this area that was, so to speak, unincorporated directly. Um, so 1872, we have a park. Uh, quite large, um, but what were we going to do? 
Uh, the United States government had no experience in doing this, and indeed, really no one had all that much experience. So we see the fellow on horseback, Nathaniel Langford, was appointed as some sort of superintendent of the park. And the park was about 9,000 square kilometers in size, and we can see by comparison, it's not quite the size of Scone. Imagine one person taking care of everything. Um, I'm not sure if this picture is, is of when Langford was actually the superintendent in the park or whether it was a picture before that, but he, we, we have somebody who was familiar with the park and familiar with the areas and was on some sort of expedition to the area before. So Langdon takes over and he immediately has two problems. His first problem is poaching, that there were people outside the park who would go into the park and would shoot uh, the bison and what other animals and deer and, and remove them from the park, the national park. His second problem had to do with Native Americans. Uh, that is to say, those that had lived there before the uh, Americans or the Northern Europeans had arrived. The question was, should they still be allowed in the park or should they be removed from the park or told that they were not allowed to enter? Uh, and this, this is a question that needed to be resolved some way or another. Now Langford had another problem. He didn't have any money. Uh, the park was established, but the Congress decided that they were not going to spend any money on it. No money at all. So this meant that Langford hung around for a while, having a thankless and impossible job. Um, he couldn't forcibly himself stop all the poaching. He couldn't remove all the Native Americans or come to an agreement with them uh, to what should be done. He would need to have, at the very least, so we say, a dozen assistants to help him and uh, some sort of budget to do certain things, but he didn't. He didn't have anything. Langford quit. Um, then we see a fellow named Norris and a fellow named Yount. Again, I'm not sure if these pictures were taken while they were superintendents of the park or not. Um, Norris complained. Yount, he got a salary. He got a thousand dollars a year to function as superintendent of the park. That doesn't sound like very much money, uh, but in the 1870s it was probably a considerable amount of money. But Jan didn't have, he didn't have enough resources to employ other people. Uh, if he was going to uh, build some sort of huts for visitors, a trail, or whatever was going to be done, it was sort of more or less impossible. And at the same time, there were maybe a few hundred people that uh, a year coming from the east that managed to make it to the park to see things and so forth. Uh, and there were the Native American Indians there at the same time, sort of like wondering, what are these strange people doing here, looking at things and so forth. Um, so uh, Yont quit after a year. So. So clearly there was there was some sort of need for order. And that was what the Congress decided, or the Congress together with the government at the time. Um, Langford and all the other fellows, they were clearly worthless, um, even though they had an impossible situation. So in 1886, a detachment of the United States Army arrives and the photograph on the left, we can see some of the first that arrived and they arrived in wagons and so forth and set up tents absolutely clueless about how to run a national park, but they would at least get rid of the poachers and keep the Native Americans away and whatever they would do. Well, after a few years, um, <clears throat> they didn't want to keep living in tents. Um, so we can see at some point, uh, essentially some sort of town or uh, 
what was called at one point Fort Yellowstone was constructed. Um, so we see that, th that the army arriving meant that certain things that were detrimental to the park uh, were stopped, for example poaching. Um, there could be some sort of regulation as to who could be in the area, not too many people and so forth. But on the other hand, all these soldiers would require uh, buildings, uh, they would require various kinds of services. Um, it's not uh, quite clear exactly what they did outside of this build-up area. They were riding around and maybe they were functioning as guides to particular locations. Uh, but there was an environmental impact that arose from the existence of the army being there. And again, we're still realizing, well, we realized that the army was clueless about ecology. There were maybe problematic relationships that developed with animals. I suppose, as we see in the postcard on the left, uh, that civilians that were employed in the kitchens and so forth for feeding the troops, um, well, they dumped waste in the park someplace, and along came the bears and maybe found something there. Uh, and it was quite acceptable to have sort of half-tame bears that became sort of sensitized to the fact that humans could provide them with food. Uh, and that's how you ate, as opposed to uh, the bears would continue in their natural habitat. Uh, there was a concern at some point also that certain wild animals were too dangerous for human visitors and so maybe bears were shot and wolves were shot and their numbers decreased in this national park. We have uh, the US Army um, running Yellowstone for at least 25 years. Uh, but there was uh, an understanding that slowly grew in various circles that it might not have been such a good idea to have the army. Uh, of course they had uh, an organization, they got things done, but maybe they didn't get the right things done and maybe there should be some sort of other organization that will be replacing the army. Uh, so at some point uh, in 1910 or 19 something like that, I think it was about 1912, um, from having the army on the left, uh, we have on the right um, some people here who are uh, not in the army, but they are the National Park Service. And the National Park Service begins to be organized um, shall we say, around somewhat militaristic ways of organizing things. They have the U.S. Army as some sort of role model of how they're going to organize themselves. So there's some sort of inheritance of this, and it could be that initially the sort of way of running the National Park didn't change all that much when the National Park Service took over. We can see the uh, original National Park Service uniform on the left. Uh, this changed in 1928. And at some point we have women who are also park rangers. And it's this title being called a park ranger coming from uh, a kind of class of soldier called a ranger. Somebody that would be living off the land and uh, going great distances. In Sweden you have uh, Fjelljägere and all these other things. It would be a somewhat kind of similar kind of idea. And so we go on. We can see that to this day the park rangers the uniforms uh, and so forth, uh, their vehicles, um, it's, it looks a bit like the police. And it's as if there's some sort of semi-police um, culture uh, among the park rangers. Uh, of, of course, there is the idea of taking care of nature, long-term considerations, um, uh, preservation and conservation of nature, but there is some sort of inheritance that still is there, as can be seen, that, that comes from decades of, of the U.S. Army running the national parks. And this was not just limited to Yellowstone. At some point, um, 
when the uh, state of California was formally still supposed to be in charge of Yosemite, um, the U.S. government did step in and decide that it would be the U.S. Army that would go in and maintain order there. So between the establishment of Yosemite and Yellowstone and 1912 when the National Park Service is established, additional national parks were founded uh, and the U.S. Army in varying degrees sort of ran that for the US United States Congress. Uh, but then the National Park Service took over and we can imagine that a number of initial employees in the National Park Service um, had worked as park rangers as part of the United States Army. So one could think that it would take a few decades for the National Park Service to sort of abandon everything that was a part of the Army and ha employ new people who had no experience of being in the Army before. Again, just like Acadia or other national parks, uh, there are entrance fees. Um, and uh, Yellowstone National Park and Grand Teton National Park are close to each other. So if you enter one, you can enter the other in some sort of uh, permit for both of them. Uh, we can see in the lower right how there are some buffalo which are decided to just sort of stand. Uh, and this creates a traffic jam of some sort. In fact, um, Americans that have longer term vacations, they generally go on vacation in August. And the number of visitors with cars in Yellowstone National Park skyrockets during the month of August. Um, and at least in the past, there have been so many vehicles driving around there that it's as if there is suddenly a number of small cities in terms of air pollution. Um, so a sort of hint, if you want to go to Yellowstone National uh, Park and avoid air pollution, don't go there in August when there are significant jumps in levels of certain kinds of air pollution, thanks to all the visitors. So the National Park Service in the past has encouraged people to park their cars on the edge of the park and then uh, be driven around in half uh, the size of city buses which would run on natural gas or propane uh, with um, that would mean there'd be fewer emissions per person and uh, natural gas and, and, and butane have in general less of an environmental impact from their emissions uh, locally and regionally but it is still a greenhouse gas. Moving on to the final national park that I'm going to talk about. This is Everglades National Park, which is located in the very southern tip of Florida. And in fact, the Everglades was located very close to Miami. Uh, when I say Miami here, I mean the city of Miami, but I also mean the metropolitan area, the number of, uh, of cities in addition to Miami located on the Atlantic coast. The Everglades is located more or less on the south and western coast of the tip of uh, Florida. In the 1880s, there were um, various companies and individuals that wanted to drain the swamps in the area and sw sell off this land and uh, that the land might be suitable for agricultural purposes, growing oranges or whoever, whatever it would be done. And uh, here we can see a picture. Uh, that could have been from this time. Uh, the low, the, the, the land would be dug up in some places uh, and then the water would sort of stay in these narrow canals. <clears throat> so these sort of, so to speak, land developers were at least uh, initially starting to uh, transform the Everglades as it was before, hardly used by uh, Americans uh, into something else. In the 1920s, there was the start of organized interest to stop this exploitation, or at least to, to limit it or to slow it down and to set aside certain areas as a forest preserve or something like that. Um, and as opposed to uh, George Doerr in the Acadia, opposed to uh, Ferdinand Hayden in Yellowstone and, and John Muir in, in Yosemite, here we have Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, uh, who was a newspaper reporter um, 
who was one of the people that was uh, at first joined this organized interest and then took a very leading role. Um, and she was able in ways that the others were not able to, to through the craft of language and detailed knowledge that she got being a journalist and wanting to you know, find out and know her sources. She managed to really put a lot of argument into this and we see this book, The Everglades River of Glass, uh, which helped function as some sort of uh, uh, argument and inspiration and convincing more and more people that something needed to be done. We can also think of her perhaps as an influencer, so to speak, although she wasn't selling or trying to convince people to do other things, lifestyle, it was just the, the Everglades. And so a decision was made already in 1934 that uh, a national park or something like that needed to be established, in, at least in part of the Everglades. And the Everglades National Park actually started in 1947. Now the Everglades National Park only covers 20% of the original area of what would have been the Everglades at one point in time. Uh, but that's obviously much better than anything else. And uh, the pictures we see, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas when she was not all that old, and the grand old lady in this century, uh, still giving interviews and so forth. Now, as we understand, many national parks in the United States that, um, have been established because of natural beauty or because of a very specific feature or interest. For example, the geysers in Yellowstone National Park. Those are the national parks that we, we, we have, uh, we've looked at already. When it comes to the Everglades, it is claimed that this was the first national park in the United States where there was an original purpose that had to do with ecology. There was, there was a sense of an ecosystem and that you needed to preserve a very large area um, for the ecosystem to continue to work. So this was one of the first or perhaps uh, the first national park in the United States established based on ecological principles as opposed to everything else just being it looked beautiful or something like that. A similarity of course with the Everglades compared to the other national parks was that you wanted to save land from development. In Acadia all the rich people were buying up property and building cottages. Uh, in, in Yellowstone there was a concern that that the land would be taken over by others and it would be commercial interests and you would have um, quite uh, commercial and, and that there would be destruction of the landscape in the in the interest of short-term tourist profits. And then we have logging and so forth in Yosemite. A difference here is that because this national park is located very close to an urban area, all these other parks I'm talking about are, are uh, surrounded by low population density areas, but in this case it's quite different. So it was necessary at some point for the urban inhabitants on the southeastern coast of Florida to have more fresh water, and the aquifer in the Everglades would be a fantastic place to get their water. And if we protected the Everglades, then maybe we would have the aquifer intact and we would still be able to get fresh water uh, from that. So Miami's water supply has, at least during a number of decades, been better than it otherwise would have been thanks to the preservation of this ecosystem service. Now, the word ecosystem service wasn't being used at that time, um, but uh, we can see that the establishment of the National Park was for more nature, um, uh, nature preservation reasons, nature for its own right, but it has an indirect effect that there is some sort of nature conservation. The water supply is secured um, for generations to come. Uh, on the other hand, at some point in time with climate change and sea level rise, um, maybe there will be saltwater intrusion into the aquifer, but that's another story. So now we have seen some of the national parks in the United States. We have looked at these four, 
we can see in the summary table the names and the order, the, the names of the park, and, uh, and they are in order of how they were presented. Uh, we can see the size of the parks and when they were opened. Uh, Yosemite, as we understand, was set aside much earlier than that, but uh, it um, became considered to be a national park when it was decided by the United States government in 1890 that uh, um, California was doing a bad job of it. We can see here that uh, uh, Yellowstone National Park and Everglades National Park are considerably larger, and Acadia is not very large at all. Um, on the other hand, there's a lot of land and sea around Acadia where there aren't all that many uh, people now. So um, there could be other forms of nature protection around uh, Acadia. Now, the United States is a federal country. This means that um, a, a federal uh, country is either one which you had different kinds of nation states or colonies or equivalent that joined together to form some sort of federation and that certain powers are at the national level and certain other powers are kept at the state level or province level or whatever it's called. And a characteristic of a federal country is that each state or province has its own constitution um, and that the national level has a constitution or there's more than one constitution uh, and the distribution of powers is determined by the various constitutions. This means that the states have uh, clear and their own clear powers and their own powers that the national government is not allowed to deal with and vice versa. Although how these powers evolve through time and what was written in the constitutions and constitutions might need to be updated and so forth. What we can see in the United States is that states also have forms of nature protection. Uh, and I'm going to take a short look at two states, California and New York. When it comes to California, there is something referred to as the Department of Parks and Recreation. Uh, and we can see how certain lands are, uh, were bought, taken over by the state of California, and became state parks. Some of these state parks have an equivalent kind of function and level of protection as federal national parks, and others do not. So it varies considerably. Um, you have everything from purely recreational parks, which are really designed for humans to, to, to uh, enjoy life and have sports or whatever in, in meadows and lawns. And then you have all the way to areas of land which have the same kind of protection as federal national parks. Now the amount of protected land that the California Department of Parks and Recreation has is not nearly as great as uh, the federal level. Uh, when we look at the state of California uh, and the land that they have set aside uh, for some sort of serious nature protection and the federal national parks or equivalent in the state, um, for every two square kilometers of state parks there are nine square kilometers of federal parks. And we know that in the past that John Muir and others thought that California did a very poor job of looking after the parks when the state purchased land, sometimes the state purchased small amounts of land to protect, for example, coastal redwoods as opposed to the mountain redwoods in Yosemite National Park, and the federal government didn't do anything. So in the northwestern part of uh, California along the Pacific coast, there are a large number of coastal redwoods, which are not the same species as the mountain redwoods. And the federal government really wasn't all that interested in that, or there was no champion of this that managed to impact on the uh, federal level. It was first in the 1960s and 1970s that the federal government established a Redwood um, National Park in um, the northwestern part of California. And the state had already established protected land areas. Um, so in this sense, at that time, California was ahead of the federal government. 
This Department of Parks and Recreation, it seems to be modeled on the United States National Park Service. They have somehow similar uniforms. <clears throat> Everyone's standing there. It almost looks like they have guns. Again, sort of like police. And in some places in California, uh, the Department of Parks and Recreation that has land which is protected like a national park, and right beside it there is a federal national park, that there's coordination between uh, the state and the federal level in their regulations and how the parks are managed and taken care of. So uh, near the Redwoods uh, Federal National Park in California, there are state parks which have the National Park classification according to the IUCN. Let's go to uh, New York State. I'm talking about New York State as opposed to New York City. New York City is located on the Atlantic Coast. Uh, New York State is much larger and large amounts of New York State are quite different than New York City. There are no federal national parks in the state of New York. We saw the map earlier where we could see where the national parks were located, most of them in the western half of the United States, many in Alaska, and in the eastern half there are not nearly as many and they tend to be smaller. On the other hand, the state of New York has a number of recreational areas, recreational parks. And this is the case with New York and the case with many other states. But what makes New York State a little different is that there are two rather large protected areas where there's an overarching sort of body which, or government agency which deals with these, and yet it's not just one kind of form of nature protection. Essentially, all of the IUCN levels of nature protection are present in different places like a patchwork quilt in the same localized geographic area. And that this seems to be a rather unique way of dealing uh, with nature protection. So in the state of New York, we have the Department of Environmental Conservation. It should be called preservation if it's going to be like John Muir, but anyway, it's called conservation, Pincho. And this is separate from another department which deals with the primarily recreational areas. The Department of Environmental Conservation has these two particular parks um, that it manages and it coordinates activities there. We have the larger uh, in the north of the state of New York, Adirondack Park, established in 1892. And then we have Catskill Park, established in 1885. And if we look at uh, these maps, where we see the sort of yellow area of the state of New York on the Atlantic with Long Island and so forth, uh, that is where the city of New York is. The overwhelming majority of the population is, is located there. Um, Adirondack Park, uh, at present about 24,000 square kilometers. So it's at least two Skona in size. Um, some of the land is owned by individuals, some of it may be owned by companies, uh, but about half of the land is owned by the state of New York. And of that, about half of that is protected in such a way that it is equivalent to an IUCN uh, 1A or 1B. In other words, essentially a wilderness area. So that means about 25% of the whole park is that. When it comes to the Catskills, we're located much closer to where there are a lot of people. Uh, although on the other hand, we're located much closer to the city of New York. And what we see here is that we see a sort of similar relationship between a large urban area that we saw with the Everglades. Miami versus the Everglades. And here we have New York City versus the Catskills. And so certain areas in the Catskills uh, hydroelectric dams were created to help provide water supply to the city of New York. Uh, otherwise the city would have had a serious problem. And other areas near that would have a much higher level of nature protection. And again about half of the land in the Catskills is owned by the state of New York or by New York City because of the need for this uh, water supply. Uh, the name Catskill has nothing to do with killing cats. Um, it is suggested that um, Dutch 
settlers as opposed to English settlers um, because before New York was an English colony there was a, a, a uh, New Amsterdam and the whole area was part of a, a Dutch colony in the United States and it suggested that that by cat they didn't mean a domesticated cat they meant so we say a mountain lion and to kill was having something to do with rivers or the bottom of a river it's unclear if that's exactly what the what the, the name uh, came from so again what we see here is that we have the various all essentially all the IUCN levels of of nature protection present within these green areas particularly in the Adirondack Park and you can have a wilderness area right beside something which would have be the equivalent of a national park in terms of protection and then maybe at, beside that you would have something which was more like a nature preserve so in the Adirondacks there are ski resorts there are small towns the, the, the use of land in and around the, the town is restricted. In the 1890s, after Adirondack Pact was established, the constitution of the state of New York was in, in part rewritten. And both Adirondack Park and Catskills Park were written into part of the constitution, saying that these parks existed and that parts of them should re remain in a wild state forever. That was uh, quite an early idea compared to other places here. So that it were going to, that we're actually going to discourage people from being there as opposed to a national park where we encourage people to visit. I think we need to start summing some of this up. Um, in the United States, um, to establish a national park, it requires an act of Congress. Uh, and there are certain criteria that were used in the past, uh, very subjective. Uh, natural beauty or specific features were important, and if we managed to convince enough congressmen, then they would say, yes, this will be a national park. This has changed through time so that it is more sort of a scientific criteria uh, that becomes weighed into more the establishment of the scientific park. Uh, it's still the case if we have groups that are lobbying or individual key influencers, they in turn managed to influence the national politicians to make a decision about this. And in many cases, it's been the, the idea to save the land that has this natural beauty away from being destroyed by the encroaching industrial civilization for cutting down trees, for establishing mines and ruining the landscape and ruining the, waters, the water table and so forth, or the building of hydroelectric dams or draining water for agriculture. All of these, or maybe just some of these, could be reasons for establishing a national park. And we have this history, this inheritance from the United States Army in Yellowstone, Yosemite, and other places, where we have this sort of half police, half nature protection employee, park ranger, um, uh, who, who um, runs the day-to-day -day activities of the park under the director of some sort of park under direction of some sort of park director. I can also say that the National Park Service has responsibility for things which are not national parks. There could be historical locations uh, where there might be an important building and a few hectares of park land around it in an urban setting. Uh, so it's not in always nature that the National Park Service is protecting. So does the United States have uh, 1A and 1B areas? Yes. I've mentioned before, of course, about the state of New York having uh, 1A and 1B areas or areas that could be classified that like that or close. But the United States does have at the federal level forms of protection which are 1A or, um, or 1B on the IUCN scale. So the Wilderness Protection Act from 1964 um, established the possibility of, of creating places that would be have a much higher environmental protection uh, to uh, discourage uh, or definitely not encourage a human access to these particular areas. The national parks uh, are administered by the National Park Service, the national forests are, are maintained by the Forest Service, and there are other organizations. So the wilderness protection areas could be taken care of 
by Nas the National Park Service or the Forest Service or other organizations. So there's no uniform uh, organization, a sort of wilderness protection service. And the state could, besides New York, have 1A and 1B areas that they've decided themselves on. And we can see, as I said before, the state of New York has that. We see also in a, in a country like the United States that at the federal and state levels, there can be environmental protection. But if we go back to the original constitution uh, in 1783, there's of course no mention of environmental protection. Uh, and the inclusion of additional parts in the constitution that have been added, so-called amendments uh, from um, the late 1780s up until uh, relatively recently, environmental protection really isn't listed there either. Uh, so this means that it has, is, should we say, legally a bit unclear. Uh, in this sort of vacuum, we can say that both the federal and state levels have decided ultimately that, that environmental protection is something that they both have as a as a competence that they are allowed to do that. We can see in the past in the 1800s the federal government was very reluctant um, to work with environmental protection. Um, state mismanagement uh, like in California's case um, and other reasons uh, when we come to the early 1900s with the establishment of the National Park Service in 1912 um, and other decades or other periods of time close to that, uh, we can see that the construction of the idea of the United States um, starts to become linked to national parks. And it becomes part of the project of building a nation. The, the nation had emerged from a war between the North and the South. Um, the geographic extent of the United States was more or less uh, complete. Um, at the end of the 1800s, uh, some federal lands were still not states, um, but and and it was it was something that sort of became important. Uh, having national parks as a distinction from other countries, particularly the old world countries in 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 Europe. <clears throat> so next. We have this question which I brought up before uh, about the original inhabitants of what is now the United States, the so-called Native Americans, previously referred to as Indians. Um, and what we can see is that during the first uh, decades of the late 1800s and um, many decades in the 1900s, nature protection was part of some sort of project of, of, of uh, the European descendants taking over all this land. We take over this and, and we're not going to use it other, for anything other than National Park and the Native Americans are not allowed there unless they're tourists like everybody else. You can't live there and we don't recognize your rights of using the area from before. Um, on the other hand, it seems that during recent decades, there is some sort of understanding that perhaps the Native Americans, that uh, the descendants of the Native Americans that for centuries lived in these areas or hunted and fished in these areas or whatever they did, maybe they should be given some of these rights back. And so Native Americans in the state of Alaska are granted some exceptions in the wilderness areas that they are allowed to do certain things that other American citizens are not allowed to uh, do. So what we can see here is that the United States for a long period of time was progressive when it came to nature protection. Of course, it was sort of unclear what a national park actually was, uh, and there were mistakes that were made, uh, but there were very few other countries that had something that would be like a national park. So from the 1870s and onward, more or less, we can see that the United States functions in a pioneer. Uh, but uh, approximately 100 years later, um, I would suggest uh, that the United States having a pioneering role in environmental protection uh, 
in the form of, of setting aside land for protection, but also in, in the form of other environmental politics and environmental laws, uh, that the whole U.S. political system seems to have sort of stopped or has moved forward very slowly in the area. Um, and um, it would appear that in, uh, shall we say, uh, this century, the year is beginning with a, two, the, a 20 as opposed to a 19, it seems to be very difficult to see the United States functioning at a national level in a very progressive way when it comes to uh, nature protection and, and environmental work. Uh, it's a bit of a paradox because there are a number of companies with technical innovations which are beneficial for the environment that could be located there, but there is not much, very much interest in the, in the part of the United States political system as a whole at this moment to be very progressive in, in the area of the environment. So we see that um, certain countries in Europe and then as the EU expands, the EU takes on a, a, a role that was not originally intended when the EU was established. Um, and Japan also seemed to, at the international level, have a more leading role in the area of the environment. And these countries with much greater population density, uh, by and large, it's more difficult to set aside as much land as in the United States to establish national parks. So in some cases, these countries with dense populations have to have other forms of nature protection instead. And we'll talk about that uh, at another time. So that was the end. Thank you very much for participating, listening and watching this video.